I am Marcia Salkoff Eskin. This lecture was named in honor of my son, Jonah Salkoff Eskin, speaking in, on behalf of Jonah's dad and brother. I would like to tell you a little about Jonah and how we came to honor him at the Library of Congress. Jonah's keen observance of wildlife demonstrated his love of nature. Learning to play the oboe, piano, and clarinet expressed his love of music, and his love of reading inspired his appreciation of books and libraries. Over the years, the library has done a wonderful job of choosing books for this program, which has been named to honor Jonah's memory. Each presentation has reflected his spirit, and the talk is no exception nor could this year's book selection be more timely. It is reflective of Jonah's core values, to live in a world where everyone can feel safe, where love and respect for all living things are the guiding principles by which we live. As he wrote at the age of 14, just one year before his death, a peaceful world is very important to me. Like many teenagers, he sometimes found it difficult to fit in, particularly in middle school. While he enthusiastically pursued his intellectual interests, in particular his passion for science and music, his peers were excited about other activities, like sports, which he had little interest in. Coupled with his shyness, this made it difficult for him to find like-minded friends. It also led to occasional bullying, and too often he witnessed the bullying of others. Jonah's gentle soul was too easily bruised by the harsh behavior of one person to another. He devoured stories and became worldly through books. As a Hebrew school student, he studied the Holocaust as part of his Jewish education, and that led to a greater sensitivity to all injustices, past and present. He came to appreciate the universality in the Jewish story. Jonah was unable to detach himself from the suffering he observed all around him. Unfortunately, he hid many of his inner emotional struggles from his family and friends. Suicidal thinking, whether the result of mental illness, stress, trauma or loss is actually far more common and difficult to see than many realize. Some, like Jonah, are able to keep their emotional pain almost invisible. And so in 1994, a promising, gentle 15-year-old ended his life at a camp for gifted children. We honor Jonah's memory by sponsoring an annual lecture at the Library of Congress. His love of books drew him to libraries to expand his knowledge, feed his curiosity. Public libraries in particular held a special place in his heart. For Jonah, a public library was a place where everyone has equal access regardless of their social, racial, ethnic, or economic status one of the few places that provides a truly level playing field. As we remember Jonah and all that he was, we are deeply grateful to the wonderful staff at the Library of Congress, the nation's library, for allowing us to honor his memory in such a meaningful way. Thank you, Marcia, for the lovely remarks about your son, Jonah. Hello. Welcome to Talking About Race, Love, and Truth. I'm Monica Valentine from the Library of Congress, and I'm here with Cheryl and Wade Hudson of Just Us Books. This program is part two of the annual Jonah Salkoff Eskin Memorial Program. Cheryl Willis Hudson is publisher and editorial director of Just Us Books. She's written more than 25 books for children. She's the co-founder and editorial director and an independent company that focuses on black interest books for young people. Cheryl serves as diversity consultant to a number of educational publishers. Wade Hudson is an author, a publisher, and the president and CEO of Just Us Books, Inc. 
an independent publisher of books for children and young adults. He has published over 30 books, including We Rise, We Resist, We Raise Our Voices, an anthology co-edited with his wife. He also speaks to students and professional groups around the country about his life's journey, writing and publishing, and the importance of diversity and inclusion. Well, Cheryl and Wade, we're honored to have you join us today. We're here to discuss the talk, Conversations About Race, Love, and Truth. Um, and in this book, you bring together 30 award-winning authors and illustrators who share pretty frank and honest discussions about race and identity. Where did the concept for this book come from and why did you think young readers need it now? Uh, we're so glad to be with you, uh, Monica. And uh, we, two years prior to the release of the talk, uh, we published um, an anthology called We Rise, We Resist, We Raise Our Voices, which was a response to the toxic uh, political and social environment at the time. This is 2016 during the campaign for the presidential election and uh, beyond. Um, and so we wanted to address um, young people to let them know that in spite of what was going on, that they were loved, supported, uh, and uh, we wanted to encourage them. And so the talk was actually uh, a natural follow-up to that first anthology because uh, it it was it resonated with so many people, and we recognized that there was a need to have these difficult talks um, spotlighted uh, in a way that uh, we all can be empowered and informed by them. So we invited uh, thirty plus uh, authors and illustrators, diverse authors and illustrators uh, of color. Uh, to contribute. And so the talk is really dealing with those difficult conversations that parents must have with their children uh, in order to inform them and make them aware of the difficulties that they will face because of their differences, of perceived differences. And um, so we were just excited to, to have that book and it has been well received. Yeah, yeah. It is a wonderful book. Um, Cheryl, uh, each story in the book is unique and comes from a very personal place. Could you talk a little bit about how you decided which authors and illustrators to include? Uh, yes, we have a, a marvelous uh, a list of authors and illustrators. And what we really did is invited friends and colleagues in the industry whose books and messages uh, resonated with children. They've been doing the work anyway, providing wonderful stories that are culturally specific. They deal with uh, social justice. Um, we wanted a multicultural perspective, uh, not uh, only a perspective of black parents who talk to their children about how to navigate the world, but other conversations that uh, artists and illustrators had, had had with their children or their personal experiences. So we have uh, indigenous Americans, Mexican Americans, Latinx, black, Vietnamese, Jewish, Christian, biracial, the, it's a wide diversity of uh, voices and, and images. Uh, Duncan um, Tonotia, as a matter of fact, who's a Mexican uh, American and spends part of his time in Mexico and part of his time in America, had a school visit. And the, the essay that he wrote and illustrated really came from a question that one of the students asked him, like, wh where does racism come from? So these are real questions and concerns that, that kids have. Uh, Tracy Sorrell's story, for example, uh, The Way of the Anadiwagi is a Cherokee, is, is, is based in her Cherokee nation and the principles of her nation. And these are so different from the stereotypes that you will normally see about what are sometimes called American Indians. So the, the range is wide, but the best thing is that they're great storytellers and, and great visual artists. Yeah, yeah, there's just a, a wonderful range of diversity in the book. Um, what were you looking for when you were selecting these authors? We uh, are also interviewing two of the authors, Renee Watson and Adam Gidwitz. Can you tell us why you thought their stories were important to have included in this volume? And could you also describe the process of pairing them with the illustrations by Chandra Strickland and Peter H. Reynolds? Uh, I'll start with, uh, with Renee Watson. She's a fabulous storyteller. And uh, her story is called Remember This. It's a deeply personal piece, which really lifts up 
black girl joy. It reminds uh, black girls to value themselves. It talks about self-esteem beyond just physical labels of or social categories of, of what people may assign to them. So it's a beautiful verbal poet, poetic uh, affirmation of self-love. And Chandra Strickland, who illustrated the piece, had actually worked with um, Renee Watson on an earlier picture book, and it was just a natural um, chemistry there. So she was the, the perfect choice to illustrate it. And actually we had, uh, we met Adam Gitwitz, um at a seminar and uh, we were on the program with him and we heard him, uh, now he's an award-winning uh, author uh, of, of many books uh, for, for children and young adults. And during his presentation at this seminar, he talked about white privilege and he talked about it in such a profound and accessible way. We were moved uh, by his presentation and uh, following the presentation, uh, we had a chance to really sit down and, and talk with him about uh, his presentation, about what he has shared. And so we, we, we just knew that he had to be a part of this anthology. Uh, in essence, we felt that this discussion, these variety of talks would be incomplete if we did not have everyone at the table, including uh, at least a white writer. And uh, so Adam's piece is, is so profound uh, and it speaks to, uh, systemic racism and, and white privilege. And uh, we reached out to Peter Reynolds to illustrate, and Peter is again, award-winning uh, illustrator. And uh, he was just so happy to, to illustrate uh, Adam's piece. And, uh, and again, it's, it's such a profound piece. And I think that without Adam's contribution and, and, and Peter's contribution, the anthology would have been incomplete. Thank you for that. Um, you talk about how profound some of the stories in this book are, and the book tackles topics that families and educators might find it difficult to discuss with children, racism, sexism, even language discrimination. Could you tell us how you intended parents, educators, and librarians to actually use this book? Well, um, Monica, you know, words uh, matter. Everybody knows that by now, and stories are really vehicles for communicating ideas, culture, worldviews, and even specific lessons. So we consider uh, the talk a really a conversation starter, a think starter. It can be used in English classes, literature classes, uh, language arts, social studies, because it, it covers a, a full range of dealing with history, dealing with truth, dealing with omissions, um, uh, erasures. Um, so, uh, when when I was young, uh, uh, there was a saying, uh, sticks and stones uh, may break my bones, but names will never hurt me. But we know that that's not true. Na that's not necessarily true at all. Uh, words and names do hurt. You don't want to be called out of your name. Um, and there's so many stereotypes that are linked in with, within uh, literature uh, that we have customarily come to uh, accept as, as stand, standard. Um, for literature. So this book provides original stories, poems, prose, letters, thoughts, uh, images that connect the children with a number of different uh, worldviews, ethnicities, uh, subject areas, all dealing with race from a truthful and honest perspective. So librarians, teachers can really deal with it as conversation starters and for tackling questions uh, about language. For example, Meg Medina's uh, piece, uh, Abla, is a great example of language discrimination, discriminating against people who speak Spanish. Nikki Grimes wrote a wonderful poem, a Tough Tuesday, about being called out of her name, how words can really hurt, but also other words can really heal. So these are good lessons that can be taught in a lot of classroom situations and in libraries and uh, other organizations as well. There are so many different kinds of talk that takes take place uh, every day in, in this country. Um, and there are talks about, you know, racial differences, uh, uh, sexual preferences, uh, talks about poverty, which my piece uh, uh, deals with. And, and these are talks that are aimed at really reassuring uh, young people uh, who are often attacked or uh, challenged because uh, they are different in some ways. 
and to prepare them for making their way as best they can in a difficult society that uh, perhaps often frowns upon them. And I'm remembering the kinds of talks that uh, my parents had with me growing up uh, in the South uh, uh, during the civil rights era. And there were many different kinds of talks, uh, how to uh, conduct myself uh, around white people because of what could happen uh, if uh, I misspoke or said the wrong thing, or how to uh, act around the police, uh, you know, as, as a young uh, black kid growing up. So the different kind, kinds of talks, how, how to, how to uh, respond to um, elderly, the, the, the seniors in our community. So with different kinds of talks, and all these talks were really aimed at helping to, uh, us to deal with society, but also to mature and to, and to grow into wholesome and, and uh, well-informed human beings. Now, Wade, you wrote a pretty touching story in the book entitled The Bike about your family facing financial challenges. And why did you think that story was important to include? Yeah, I, I knew that there were um, black writers we invited to contribute to this anthology who would write about race uh, and write about uh, dealing with uh, police uh, encounters. Um, so I decided I wanted to write something different uh, that really wasn't about race per se. And so I recalled an incident that happened when I was very young growing up uh, in, in Mansfield, Louisiana. Uh, my family was extremely poor. There were eight children in the family uh, and my mother and father. And they were often not able because of their financial situation to buy things that we, that we often wanted, that we saw uh, kids in magazines or on television shows uh, uh, had them and we, we couldn't get them. And so this particular uh, incident happened um, when I was eight years old uh, and it was uh, re revolving around Christmas. I wanted a bike uh, and I really, you know, just knew I was going to get this bike. And on Christmas Day, you know, my, bro my brother and I, who's one year younger than me, we got up uh, Christmas morning, uh, expecting to find the bike, our uh, bikes underneath the tree, and uh, but there were no bikes, and so my my day was like crushed. Christmas was crushed for me, and uh, so my father had this talk with me uh, for the first time. I'm eight years old, explaining why he could not buy the bike. He could not afford to buy the bike, and that was the first time I would really heard my father use you know, words like poor, uh, um, financially in insecure, which is the term that we use now. And uh, it touched me profoundly. And uh, it really helped me to understand that even at eight years of age, that it really wasn't about me. You know, it was about my family. And I think that really helped to put me on a course where I was more concerned about the uh, uh, about my, my brothers and sisters and my family uh, in addition to myself. But it was a difficult conversation that my father had with me and, and I could just see the hurt and the pain in his face, even at age eight, you know, but again, it was such a profound conversation. And I, I, I think he did not want to have that conversation because when you're poor, you always think that you would be able to uh, overcome it in some way. So you keep pushing, you keep struggling, thinking that you will overcome it. And you don't want to admit the feet of that poverty is defeating you. And so I think my father had to face that and had to find a way to share that with me. Now, that, that particular story resonates now because there are so many people who have been impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic and are struggling financially. So, and I wasn't thinking about that obviously when I wrote the story, but it just resonates now with the time that we, we find ourselves in. Yeah, yeah, it's wonderful to have that included for some child that you, that, as you say, may be facing situations like that right now or parents who are having to have those kinds of discussions with their kids. Exactly. Um, there are so many personal stories shared and they're remarkable in this book. Cheryl, uh, the Library of Congress holds a number of oral history collections that also reflect the diversity of American experiences. And I'm thinking about some of the projects like the Civil Rights History Project, 
the Veterans History Project and StoryCorps. How important would you say is it that folks share their stories and their truths beyond just their families? Well, I, it's, it's very important. Um, we share uh, stories and, and one of the few places that uh, people share their stories is, is really uh, it obituaries at the end of, of life when there's a program at your church or your synagogue that relates who you are, who your children are, who you leave behind. So it's important for us to share our stories while we are uh, yet alive, uh, because sometimes with the, the with, with contemporary media, um, you, you have what's happening in the moment and not necessarily have a, a context for what's being said or what's has gone uh, be before. So uh, the, the Museum of um, African American History and, and Culture has a program there where you can uh, share in the museum some of your stories and find out about your history. So that's important to put it in, in context. Uh, one of the stories, um, and, and Wade could probably share a little bit more about that as well. Well, I, I think uh, too, Monica, that often what happens is people think that their stories are not important, that in order for their stories to be important, they have to have made some monumental uh, uh, contribution like Dr. King or uh, Rosa Parks or, or, or people like that. But all of our stories are important, uh, whether they are, they play out on in our family, within our families, or uh, within our communities, uh, within the town or city or where we live. Because in order for society to, to progress and to move forward, it takes all of us contributing and making contributions. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's important for us to recognize that each of us, each of us, is important uh, uh, in in this in this advancement of civil of civilization, and I think it's important for kids to understand that even at an, at an early age, because it really helps you to understand that what you're doing, the contribution that you are making, however small you may perceive them to be, are important. You know, yeah. and if you don't tell those stories, often those stories are lost. There are mm -hmm. so many people who contributed to the civil rights movement and their stories were considered, or their contributions were considered small, but without them, the civil rights movement would not have been what it, uh, what it, what it became. Yeah, yeah, that's true. And speaking of that, of those stories, um, Cheryl and Wade, this is for both of you. Cheryl, you might want to respond first. You are known as trailblazers in the publishing field. And there's been a push to reflect diversity in children's book in recent years. You guys saw this need over 30 years ago. Can you share a bit about your journey from self-publishing your first book, the Afrobets ABC book, to being the CEO and the vice president of your own publishing company, Just Us Books? Uh, well, uh, th thank you for asking that question. We, we uh, started our company uh, in 1988, uh, almost 33 years ago. And after years of collaborating on projects that we hope to have published with major publishing houses, we took those stories to publishing companies and they said, uh, this is not a story. Black people don't read. Uh, Black people yeah. don't buy books. Um, uh, you get somebody famous to endorse it and maybe we'll take a look at it. Uh, not even that. So we get plenty of rejections. But we say, wait a minute, we know mm -hmm. our stories. We've been in this industry, both myself as an artist, Wait as a writer. Uh, we can do this ourselves. So we, we self-published the Afrobets ABC book, which became part of a brand name for us. So A is for Africa, uh, Alligator and Apple, simple concept book, uh, which makes it, there are like four or 500 alphabet books about trunks, everything else on the internet, why not one about uh, an Afrocentric one? So that became the starting point of our company, but we eventually branched off into uh, more picture books, nonfiction history, biography, uh, chapter books, anthology, and, and here we are, just us. But again, it's uh, telling our own story. That story was important. And those books have reached, you know, thousands and thousands of kids who recognized it as their story as well, including kids who are not necessarily African-American. Um, so uh, that's kind of the journey we've been through that. And we, we're coming into a, a, a period also we've collaborated with other 
uh, publishing uh, companies or commercial publishing houses. So here we are, just us, <laughs> <laughs> in, in a nutshell. <laughs> So yes. there's, there's a lot more diversity now, but really in terms of what we're talking about, it, it goes back to 1965. It goes back to 1942. It goes back to the Brownies book in 1921. It's just that there's, there's more now. And I hope we encourage more people to be a part of that. Yes. Okay. Yes, thank you. And I will say that uh, I've, I've known about you guys for a long time. That Afro Betts book was one of my daughter's favorites when she was a little girl. She's 26 now. <laughs> and it's still in print. It's still in print. Yeah, I still see it. The talk received a starred review that ended with this quote, which I love. It says, the ingredients are all here. May this magnificent collection inspire us to move from dialogue to deep action. Uh, and I want to know, uh, Cheryl, and wait if you want to weigh in on, on this too, that would be great. Do you have any advice for readers who are ready to make that move from dialogue to action? And what would it be? Uh, advice. Keep reading. Read outside of your own box, out of, outside of your own experience. Uh, so much of what uh, people do that is wrong with the world is because they don't know about each other. They don't understand each other. So readers can benefit from all types of stories. Uh, one example might be uh, Grace Lynn's story, uh, I Am Not a China Doll, for example, which is very relevant uh, in these times. She writes a letter to her daughter. Someone comes up to her daughter and says, oh, you're just like a, a, a China doll, you're a beautiful China doll. Her mother says to, Grace says to her daughter, no, you're not a doll, you're not a toy. That's a story that needs to be read uh, by everyone um, and can be used uh, in, in ways that broaden our empathy and understanding for one another so that it gives them us a permission to be allies uh, rather than, than enemies. Um, it can sh share our human condition uh, and, and, and show uh, real shared humanity. So, yes. And, and I think too, Monica, it's, it's important that once reading sort of opens up a whole nother way of looking at the world and looking at others. Um, I was sort of, and I think Cheryl too, we were encouraged by what happened uh, after the brutal murder of George Floyd and, and uh, the other blacks who were killed um, last year. And the, the response from uh, white communities, particularly young, uh, young white white people, um, and I was wondering, uh, watching all of them protesting and taking to the streets, uh, which is to me action. You know, I was wondering how many of these young people were exposed to books written by Jackie Woodson, books written by Jason Reynolds books written by Kwame Alexander and all the other great writers and books uh, that, that are available. And perhaps those books help to open up uh, uh, them to looking at the world in a different way. Uh, and uh, so I think books are so important, but beyond the reading, it's also engaging in those discussions uh, with other people uh, because sometimes reading can be a solitary uh, pursuit but when you when you engage in conversation and share um, what you're getting from the book and how the book is impacting you with other people, it helps to broaden the experience to include other people. Yeah, absolutely. So you're absolutely right. This book is um, a wonderful tool for broadening kids' horizons and for helping to develop empathy. And I hope that parents and educators will use it to do just that. Um, Cheryl and Wade, this has been a wonderful discussion. Thank you so much for sharing your time and your wisdom with us today. Uh, we've been discussing the talk, Conversations on Race, Love and Truth, published by Crown Books for Young Readers in partnership with Just Us Books and it's available in bookstores everywhere. Uh, we invite those of you who are listening to join us for the third part of the Jonah S. Eskin Memorial Program on Tuesday, May 13th at 5 p.m. Cheryl and Wade, along with Renee Watson and Adam Gidwitz, will join us for a live Q&A on Zoom. Registration is required. Thank you so much, Cheryl and Wade. Thank, Thank you, you, Monica. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you.